<laughs> you have reached the Geek Elite. Good luck. Welcome back to another episode of VHS Gems, the Geek Elite Media podcast in which we talk about those VHSs of old. We open up a quote unquote gem box that I created myself of VHS titles that we are rediscovering and finding out whether or not they are worth their luster or if they should just stay in the treasure box forever where they came from. I am Jessica of Geek Elite. And joining with me is John. That's me. You can't take Steven's thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we have to now. He's reacted so violently last time. I know. He, he was really upset. <laughs> yeah. If you listen to our Geek Swatch, you will understand. I, Steven on a Geek Swatch quite often always announces himself as, That's me! And I mimicked him before he could announce himself and he got slightly upset it was kind of oh, sort of he funny he was not happy <laughs> he, was not, he was taken aback i felt really bad <laughs> i thought he would laugh at it and he did not <laughs> all right today we are doing our first cartoon right yeah yeah right. well the first full cartoon because there was a little animation in stay tuned uh, yeah there there was the animated skit in stay tuned which was a really great animated skit but this is a full animated feature that is surprisingly if you guys know me from other podcasts is not disney um <laughs> we are watching the secret of nim made by a lot of former disney employees too it had a disney-esque feel to it mm -hmm. <laughs> and since this came out in 1982 it would make sense that that would be the time that people started branching off from animation to go and do their own things because the Disney company was dealing with a lot of stuff around that time and kind of sort of yeah. going on a downward. It was, it, was, it was dark times. It was dark times for the Disney company in the 80s. Um, so, yes, The Secret of Nim of 1982, the story of a mouse who wants to save her children from getting plowed and also save her youngest son from dying of pneumonia and also save the rats from being experimented on and or also exterminated she's a or exterminated yeah we got our introduction to what's essentially super soldier rats yeah pretty much although like were they they kept on saying that they were intelligent so therefore they could read and whatnot and i was just really kind of confused because she could read and she didn't go through that experiment so i don't other you know, the, than they could use magic <laughs> was the 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 logic flaws become more apparent because I, I saw this when i was really little i want to say i was like five or six when i first saw this in mm -hmm. the 80s and what's interesting seeing it now is that i can distinctly remember all of the emotional beats um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of really like intense imagery um, but I'm also seeing now the story elements that don't really mesh well together like the silly crow um, that stupid crow the, yeah the really weird magical elements which mm -hmm. are not present in the books as far as I know mm. those were made up for this movie um, which is interesting, but we can get a little bit more into it and what that could mean as yeah. we go along. All right, so I think I'm just going to hop into the, the movie because I actually didn't look up trivia or didn't really look up a lot about the people that made it. <laughs> so, All right. Unless you have something you'd like to talk about before we go in the movie. Uh, we could just drive right in and we'll just pick it up as we go. All right, so this was an MGM and United Artists film. Aurora presents with Don Bluth production because it's an old animated film, so it literally starts with flashing the 
the people that made it as they did in the 80s. And it starts with that typical fantasy start of a candle getting lit by like an old book. Only in this case, instead of a story being read, it is a rat character writing about Jonathan Grisby, who was killed. That's basically the start of it. Um, leaving a widow behind. And my notes keep on turning off for some reason, so this is wonderful. <laughs> um, so <laughs> he's writing about this mouse that was a friend of the rats, and then he's talking about an amulet, and honestly, all of this was going right over my head. <laughs> so, like, even in my notes, I'm like, what is happening? I don't... <laughs> yeah, these are just kind of vague details. Um, like I said, like, the, the logic of the story gets really wonky mm-hmm. as we start going along. There's a lot of details. It's it's like an overly mature plot for what it is. Yeah, it really is overly mature. It's definitely really dark, which isn't that weird because I feel like a lot of the animated shows in the early 80s were really dark for some reason, even though they were made for children. Yeah, this is that time when you had movies like The Dark, or was it The Black Cauldron, and... Um, a few others that were more like kind of downers yeah dark fantasy and i don't know when did the lord of the not the lord of the rings the hobbit animated series come out um i want to say those were in the 70s in the 70s yeah so i'm trying to think like maybe there was something big that came out did the hobbit even do good (laughs) the what the hobbit did it do good like was it popular i I think so, because after that, they did make The Lord of the Rings as well. Um, although, I, instead of breaking it up into three, I think they made it two movies. It was The Fellowship of the Ring and then Return of the King, and The Two Towers was just, was just kind of like mixed into between them. Yeah. So, I don't know if maybe they were trying... Not that those were exceptionally dark, but it was higher fantasy, and this was a higher fantasy. This definitely had the higher fantasy. I was thinking, like, this is like the intro to Lord of the Rings or something. Yeah. Some of the plot elements that they were introducing. And skipping ahead to the end, um, the ending song very much sounded like something from The Hobbit. (laughs) Yeah, I could see that. So, maybe they were trying to pull from that sort of popularity or something um you find out that the rat character writing in the book is named nicodemus and then it goes back to like the secret of nim the title sequence and then you see a farmhouse which is a very cute little farmhouse and then it kind of sort of zooms in on this female mouse who is looking for mr ages which is another mouse who's like a scientist it seems like um it reminded me of Belle's dad, but if, if he was yeah. a little more surly. Yeah, if he, yeah, I guess he did have that Belle's dad sort of feel to him, kind of like a crazy scientist, not altogether there, but a little bit less crazy, a little bit more sane, at least when you're going with the animated Beauty and the Beast one. The newer yeah. one, he was better written, I feel, in the one with um, Emma Watson as Belle. Um, yeah. 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 And you find out that she is Mrs. Brisby, who is the widow. So she's the widow of the guy that Nicodemus was writing about, basically, that had just died. And she is looking for medicine for her son. He's sick. Um, she describes his symptoms, and the Mr. Ages is like, he's got pneumonia. He's going to die if he moves. And she's like, but we need to move because they're about to plow the field. To which I'm like, why did you put your house... And the place that gets plowed, <laughs> like, why was it there in the first place? Because it's a pretty well-established house. It's got furniture in it, cute little separate rooms. Like, it's been there for quite a while, but then I don't remember what the... Well, like, I'm, I'm going to jump and say probably because rats or well, no, these are mice. Mice having a much shorter lifespan to them, like, this could have just been done over the winter. Or what would have been the summer? I don't know. Whenever the off season is for the, whatever they're playing on the field yeah. is when they settled in. And to them, that could have been like a couple of years in like mouse time or mouse lifespan. 
um, I would which would be happening during the late off season. Yeah, I would say, but they 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 kept on talking about it like they knew it would happen every year, like they were waiting for it to happen, like they knew exactly when it was going to happen. So I'm like, well, is it one of those ancestor real, knowledge things yeah, at work? The only real conflict there is that she, like they couldn't just leave because her youngest, you know, has the pneumonia. Yeah. So. They have to devise some other way, which they realize, like, oh, well, we're going to have to move the whole house. Otherwise, if he gets exposure, he's going to die. And yeah. that's the. I think in it's other times, they convenient. could just leave for, like, a summer house that they yeah. have somewhere else. Oh, maybe. And, you know, like, they just kind of go back and forth between the seasons whenever something's being plowed, if assuming they've been there for more than one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess. Again, though, the. Like, the logic of this is something that I feel like we're not supposed to pay too much attention to. Yeah. But it's hard to kind of ignore it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a little bit hard to ignore it as an adult watching it. Um, so he gives her the medicine in an envelope and she leaves. And now she's leaving. Um, she runs into the bird. Which I can't remember. What is his name? I know I wrote it down. Jeremy. Jeremy, yes, he's a crow looking for a mate, and he's stuck in a trap of string that he caught, and the evil cat dragon is approaching, and Mrs. Brisby does a very brave thing and actually goes and protects him, which this was one of the other, like, plot things that didn't quite work for me, because she was openly willing to save this guy, and he definitely didn't deserve it because he was just making the situation worse and worse by panicking. <laughs> um, but later on, she becomes really meek and like doubts herself when it comes to saving the day. And I'm like, lady, you just saved Jeremy with no problem when a cat was approaching you. Like, I don't see <laughs> like her character flow didn't go that great for me. It's a bit inconsistent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she during that like f- kind of sort of fight or escape sequence um she drops the medicine but thankfully jeremy finds it for her and gives it to her as she's like crying because she thinks she lost her son medicine and that her son's gonna die um and jeremy was like oh hey i found this you dropped it and she's all happy and and stuff and he's basically like wanting to hang around with her because he's not good with the ladies but he wants to find a lady And, yeah, I guess he's, like, the comic relief, like, kind of character, because he's not necessary to the plot whatsoever. Yeah, he plays no important role in any of it. No, so he's the comic relief in this kind of sort of dark tale, dark fantasy tale. Um, You find out, yeah, that's, this is when you get confirmed that she's Mrs. Brisby, and this is where, I watched this before you watched it. Um, I watched it kind of earlier in the week, um, and I told you, I was like, there's something in it that really pissed me off, (laughs) and I wanted you to guess what it was as you watched it. So did you figure that out, what pissed me off so much? Yeah, I narrowed it down to two options. It was Uh like, either one, that she gives away this, like, really priceless, like, gift that was given to her, Uh just kind of off screen without any kind of fanfare. Yeah. Or the fact that she was never given, not only was she never given her first name, she's mm-hmm. only ever referred to by her deceased husband's name. Yeah, that that would be it. She is referred to <laughs> as Mrs. Brisby, which most of the movie, which would be fine. But if they say her whole name, it's Mrs. Jonathan Brisby, which drove me freaking off the wall nuts. Even though I know that for the time, that is the appropriate way, kind of, it is the appropriate way to talk about a widow in etiquette terms for the time but actually i want to say by the early 80s it had already changed to ms brisby as opposed to mrs for widows um i do believe you can learn more about that on another podcast that i do on the united states of (laughs) women podcast because there is a woman that was working for a paper that convinced papers to change it to ms for widows and single women as well so anyway um so yeah go check out that history podcast that we've got my um me and elizabeth are on that um 
But yeah, it it just drove me insane that she had like that's all she was referred to as. Like no, not even her kids. I mean, her kids just call her mom. Her friend, neighbor, was it Mrs. Shoe or something? Shrew. Um, Mrs. Shrew. Yeah. Yeah, calls her Mrs. Brisby. Like nobody calls her by a first name. Like, even people that would. She doesn't even call herself when she introduces, which I don't even think she actually introduces herself ever. Oh, no. No, she's, she says Mrs. Frisbee. I just... It drives me. It drew me off the wall. <laughs> no, but I was like, Ugh. There's another thing that kind of makes sense that said that pisses me off, but anytime I watch The Bachelor and they refer to the women as the women, drives me insane. <laughs> they feel so possessive, even though there's really no other term to say for them. It just, I, I don't know. It's it, the little it, things. It seems, it, it seems uh, reductive, I guess. Yeah, it, I mean, it doesn't help what the show is about, but like... <laughs> that too. <laughs> uh, I was like, hey, they agree to it. They put themselves on there. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's, it's just actors. <laughs> they're not actors but they're actors um <laughs> go so she gets back to the house um you see that she has quite a few kids um she has two girls and two boys um and mm, martin is her oldest boy and he's telling off the neighbor mrs Shu. Auntie Shrew, I think, is actually what they... Shrew, there we go. Auntie Shrew is what they call her. And he's, like, just telling her off, defending his mom because his mom is out getting medicine. And Auntie Shrew is like, where's your mom? Like, how dare she leave you guys alone, even though they can clearly take care of themselves. And <laughs> Bart just talks all bad. That was kind of cute and hilarious. And then Miss B Mrs. Brisby finally arrives to give Timothy his medicine. You get a cute little lullaby playing that's also kind of creepy in the way that lullabies are occasionally creepy yeah yeah and yeah that's it's basically that scene pretty much the kids the house that needs to be saved and then it cuts to the farm, which this surprised me. I didn't think it would do this, but you actually do see like the farmer and the farmer's wife as characters like they talk like i always think of like charlotte's web or maybe they do talk in charlotte's web but they seemed more central than in other animated shows that are about talking animals i guess yeah they're not just um background like they're actually having actions yeah when, which in the story yeah which are important to the plot because it cuts to showing that the wife gets a call from Nim, I guess it is from Nim, um, about asking if they have any rats and if the rats are acting weird. And as she's yeah. talking about that, the rats are clearly acting weird because they're sneaking around in the dark, stealing light bulbs, it looks like. <laughs> so, yeah, and the traps don't catch them, too. Yeah, and the traps don't catch them, but the farmer's kind of like, eh, whatever, I gotta plow in the morning, kind of thing. Um,. So, which, yeah, sure enough, um, the next day, um, Brisby wakes up to the noises of the tractor starting. It's happening. Mrs. Shrew f freaks out, runs through the neighborhood, and it's like, the plow is coming. It's moving day. It's moving day. And everybody's like, it's early. And everybody's <laughs> panicking. But then, as the tractor's coming, Brisby, like, tries to get on it to stop it somehow. And she doesn't succeed because it's shaking and she's tiny. But Mrs. Shrew, no, sorry, Auntie Shrew, just obliterates the tractor like it was nothing. She just goes in and cuts the fuel line like this, 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 and then blames Mrs. She's like, Mrs. Br like, you need to, you know, get up, girl. Like, come on. And I was like, Mrs. Shrew, like, you were just running and freaking out and then you go and stop the tractor like you could have done that the whole time like how come you guys never thought of that before i think miss auntie shrew was part of that <laughs> nim experiment as well i mean she definitely knew what to go for and how to get it done yeah she she just zoomed in there and just took it out like it was nothing and then blamed mrs prisby for not being able to do that when she had been panicking like three minutes before as well it was just a very interesting switch in character as well. Just yeah, 
but all I really did is buy them like maybe a day at most, I think. They still had to try to figure out um, what they were going to do to get out of there. Which yeah. I thought it interesting too because the, the their family is living like inside of a cinder block from the looks of it. And I was like, wouldn't that thing be relatively protected? Or would the plow just like shred it up? I don't know. I would I don't know. I don't know yeah. how strong plows are. I don't I would assume that the farmer would clear his land before he plows it. Yeah, like take <laughs> those big gigantic chunks of cinder out of there and yeah. then start plowing. Yeah, like you don't want to damage your blades on there or anything. Yeah. Um but no. And then I guess through some further conversation, she ends up having to go talk to the great owl the great owl that by the way eats mice but you gotta go talk to the dude so sh- yeah she has jeremy fly her to the great owl which he looked really cool yeah i mean there was some cool animation throughout this thing for being of uh, what from 1982 and from the time when animation was definitely taking a dip in mainstream mm-hmm. uh cinemas this one really was trying to be like really well detailed i had like a lot of really interesting and cool uh, sequences of animation and one of the things that i remember the most from being a kid is those freaky ass glowing eyes that both the owl and nicodemus have Mm -hmm. um for some reason just seeing those cartoons in the dark as a kid um (laughs) Yeah, they, they freaked me out a little bit. As a matter of fact, I was going to bring it up, but mm-hmm. one of the opening credits, uh, the production logos is for Universal Artists, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a time when any time that particular logo would come up, yeah. I would get a little PTSD. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I'd have to change the channel because I couldn't, because I knew what was coming. Even if it wasn't this movie, it still freaked me out. And I was like, nope, I don't want to see this, what's coming next. Because there were some sequences that five-year-old me was just a little too freaked out by. Uh, especially, I think, the first time I ever saw cartoon blood was in this movie. Oh, yeah, there is actually a lot of blood in it, huh? Yeah, and I was like, oh, wow, that's really freaky. Uh, but we can get to that in a bit. So the yeah. great owl basically is telling her that she needs to go see the rats of Nim to help her mm-hmm. with her problem. And she's like, what rats? <laughs> Just, I didn't know there were rats. I'm like, hey, there's rats. They live in the rose bush in the front yard of the farmhouse. Um, so she has Jeremy fly her there. And then she kind of sort of sends him off on a task to get string because she wants him out of the way so that he's not alerting Dragon the cat who is a cat that also looks really cool and creepy and has one like gray eye. So he's blind in one eye. It looks like, um, you find out a little bit later that her husband died trying to poison the cat, I believe. Yes. So, um, she manages to find the door to the rats and it's guarded by a well as she goes in there is a rat with a staff and he just attacks her although she's trying to explain who she is and that she needs to talk to his leader Nicodemus and he just keeps on attacking her and she's just kind of like it takes her a while to realize that she's being attacked and she's just like dodging backwards like what what are you doing? Like, just I'm here to go find Nicodemus. <laughs> but she ends up running into Mr. Ages again. Um, the mouse Mr. Ages. And she explains that she saw the great owl. And the great owl told her to go see Nicodemus. So Mr. Ages agrees to take her to Nicodemus. Since she is the widow of Jonathan Brisby. Um, I, yeah, okay, so, and then it cuts to Nicodemus, who is apparently seeing all of this in his amulet while this is going on, so he's spying on her, so he knows what's gonna happen, I guess he's a prophet rat of some kind, which is why he's the leader, 
and he mentions that I cannot remember the name of this dude, but the black rat guy that he's going to get oh. in her way. <laughs> so like Jenner Jenner Is it Jenner? I don't know. I can't remember. I think I wrote his name down later. Um and then it cuts back to her traveling through and sh- they run into Justin, the captain of the guard, who is a very, I can only say handsome rat that she pretty quickly <laughs> flirts with. She's literally like, hey, like, I'm yeah, recently they ex- widowed. They were exchanging some interesting glances back and forth. Yeah, they, they really were. Um, Justin is the one that explains that they have discovered electricity and they get into this cute little lantern elevator thing and they basically run into the rat that Nicodemus was just talking about, the black rat, who is trying to start a coup against Nicodemus. He's trying to take over the rats because he doesn't think Nicodemus is right in the fact that they need to leave for the thorny grove or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And get out of the rose bushes. Yeah. He thinks that they don't have to do that because the farmer oh, doesn't want them to yeah. oh yeah he doesn't want them to get because they think they're fine and it's perfectly okay that they're stealing electricity and nobody's gonna notice um which i guess i don't i feel like i wouldn't notice if my rats were stealing electricity from me but it's <laughs> nim knows what they created um <laughs> Let's see. So they're all mad that Mrs. Brisby is there until Justin is like, it's Mrs. Jonathan Brisby. And they go, Jonathan, he saved our lives. Like he, you know, he was our friend. And therefore, it's okay for her to go talk to Nicodemus. (laughs) So that's, that's the only way she gets through is that she is Jonathan's wife. If she was any other mouse, who cares? Even if her family is about to die. (laughs) She only got through on the virtues of the man that was in her life. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, they do agree that they are going to help her. Um, In the meantime... Oh, she didn't send Jeremy off to get strings. She sent him off to watch her kids. That's what it was. And Mr. Shrew catches the crow, Jeremy, and ties him up. And you get this um, little scene of her children Mrs. Brisby's children realizing no this is the crow that she helped out we can release him like it's fine and that's pretty much it for that yeah. scene <laughs> just, just the, the comic relief yeah, yeah. No, th- then when she meets Nicodemus uh, mm-hmm. that's when we finally get a bit of a backstory Yep. Um, the mythology I would like to call it uh, which was always my favorite part of the story mm-hmm is uh, he- hearing the the history of how they came into being because um, it's very like flowers for Algernon um, yes it very much is where yeah we find out that the rats had been experimented on they all started as just regular street rats mm-hmm. they were rounded up by NIM which is, stands for the National Institute of Mental Health I think and yep, probably yeah so they, they show you that they do all kinds of animal tasting here. They have, like, chimps and rabbits and dogs. Um, and they, Nicodemus recounts just how horrible uh, some of those conditions were where he would hear the screeching of the, you know, other suffering animals. Mm-hmm. But they were given that experimental serum that made them intelligent. And, yeah, so he, he realized he could read suddenly and... Um, they all were able to then reason and logic and figure out how to get out of the, their enclosures. They lost the majority of the mice that were with them, except for Jonathan Brisby and, and Mr. Mr. Ages. Ages. Um, but yeah, it was Jonathan, because of his smaller size, was able to unlock the, I guess, the latch to the heating or the air vents mm-hmm. in order for them to make their final escape. Yeah. Which... I find interesting only because it looks like this is happening in the city, but yet somehow Nim is like reaching out, I'm guessing to local farmers or just local people are in the surrounding area saying like, hey, have you seen rats doing anything funny lately? Yeah. Because like they know that 
you know, what they did caused the rats to, like, you know, essentially mutate or evolve. Um, so I, that's why I find it kind of interesting. That I wanted to see more of that, of what's going on there. This movie does have a sequel, but I don't know how faithful it is to the books or to this one. The sequel? Just... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I just, uh, the other thing, though, is like I said, by this point, we're definitely seeing a lot of kind of supernatural stuff with Nicodemus, mm -hmm. where he has that thing that lets you see the past. And he gives her this amulet, which, you know, Nicodemus tells her contains like power or something. Power of some kind, which yeah. I just, they got intelligence and then they somehow also got magic as well because Nicodemus is yeah. clearly a prophet they all fight with swords like from the renaissance from ye old and medieval times and it's just I don't I kind of this is another one where like with Return to Oz like I kind of want to read the source material because this is really ridiculous <laughs> like uh, the books the the books are more relatable I want to say because okay. I remember from when I was a kid they're, they don't have those fantastical elements. It still tells you basically the same story, but without the magical stuff in it. Um, and to me, it makes more sense. Like the, I think they just wanted to really make mm. a animation spectacle, yeah. which is why they put in, and they needed an excuse to put in all these nice glowy special effects for the animation. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think the books make more sense. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely focused on how animals are more intelligent than we think they are and therefore like what gives us the right to experiment on them um which we do still in the psych ward do animal testing i do believe they stopped testing on monkeys though but i know rabbits are probably still tested on and rats are definitely still tested on so um but it's sort of one of those, I guess, kind of catch-22 over kind of have to experiment on something to figure out if it will actually work. Stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th th there's the whole thing about being humane about it, I suppose. You know, this, yeah. that's, that's part of it. But and yeah, there's some experiments where you're like, was it really necessary to give LSD to a dolphin? I'm like I don't think that was what are you gonna learn from that? <laughs> yeah, no, and there's stuff like that, but there is definitely I mean, when I was in school six years ago now, going for my psych degree, you, you kinda sort of learn there is ethical committees that do ensure that that you the animals should be treated as well as possible. Um but they're still experimented on, you still I don't think we do lobotomies anymore on them. I think we figured out the brain as much as we can. Um, and it is significantly harder to get animals to test on as well. You have to really prove that your experiment is going to gourds, go towards the betterment of something. So, yeah. But we also still experiment on people as well in an ethical way as well. I mean, all the vaccines <laughs> we have, we have because they've been experimented on by a test group of people. Yeah, or sometimes we just flat out don't tell people what they're being given, and well, we're pleasantly surprised afterwards by the results. Yeah, there's that. I think they should be. It's very interesting because it's in order for a study to be done correctly, especially when it comes with drugs and stuff, is you should typically do a double blind test where even the people giving the test do not know if you're getting a placebo or if you're getting the actual stuff. And I think you are told, like, what's in it. I think you are told what could possibly be side effects when you're in it. I'm not for sure. Um, but, yeah, you're basically signing a waiver to, you know, find out if the drugs that you're getting are possibly going to give you a heart attack or blood clots or something like that. But the more people that take that medication, the more we can learn how people of all, all different types of people will react to it. It's very interesting doing experiments like that and drug tiles <laughs> and all that stuff it was interesting to learn about at least oh yeah 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 especially since the ethicalness only came in within the last like 30 ish years and it mainly came because of world war ii and what germany did so oh. 
uh, even though the United States still, well after World War II, had a lot of issues uh, with ethical experiments such as um, the Stichy, I can never say it, the Stichy syphilis trials. Highly unethical yep. there. Very Hell unethical yeah. and should be talked about more. Also, the Stafford, Staff, Stanford, was it Stanford or Stafford? I can't remember. Stanford prison experiment, too, is also a highly unethical one that we basically learn nothing from. Another unethical <laughs> study that people still like to use is the blue eye, brown eyes study. Oh, it's yeah. done on children. Yeah. Still was not ethical to be done at the time that it was done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's just really important to keep those checks and balances in place and to make sure studies being done are ethical. And that's why we have ethical committees. I don't know. I, I just went in a weird psychology soapbox there with ethical studies. That's great. Okay, back to NIM. <laughs> uh, so Nick Adamas gives her the amulet and she they agree to move her house with their intelligence and... Even though she's proven that she's intelligent by the fact that she can read, because she reads about how her husband died, basically, which she didn't even know how he died. Um, and she decides that she is going to do, but her as husband could not, she is going to try to poison Dragon. Which needed to happen so that they could escape, I think, was why Dragon needed to yeah, be poisoned. Yeah, to buy them enough time to get out unnoticed. Yeah. Because even though he was a big, fat cat, he was still very, like, sadistic apparently and yeah. like to torture animals yeah he was a lucifer type cat over <laughs> yeah over like a nice cat he was definitely well he's a farm cat which farm cats are supposed to kill the rats and the mice so that you know they don't bring diseases into the farm or onto the crops like it actually is kind of an important thing because rats and mice tend to bring in fleas and fleas tend to bring in disease so that's yeah. where you get the plague um Though, I mean, cats are important. It is important for them to be evil. Mice need to be eaten. But <laughs> but in this case, it's not important because Mrs. Brisby needs to poison him. So she works with Justin to go and poison the cats. And she manages to put the poison into the kibble. But the kid catches her. <laughs> and Yeah. Yep, and then puts her in a little bird cage. Puts her in a bird cage. Which, another thing that used to freak me out, my grandma used to have, I swear, exactly that same birdcage, right down to the little designs on the outside of the cage, like those mm -hmm. little loopy loops, yeah. and the way that the water tray slid in, and all of these different little details about that birdcage. My grandma used to have it. Wow. So, my child brain used to put two and two together and say, oh shit, like... <laughs> this is happening here it's like, real <laughs> that mouse was in this cage yeah that's I, I was a really dumb kid i feel like i would have believed that i don't think you were dumb <laughs> you just had a vivid imagination and like tied it to whatever i mean power rangers was real to me and i was the purple <laughs> ranger that didn't exist so <laughs> yeah i didn't want to be yellow or pink i wanted to be the purple ranger and i'm very upset that there wasn't one that's fair. Oh, there were in some of the other iterations. Yeah, I, I have looked up that there is a Purple Ranger somewhere, but I am yeah. not diving deep into Power Rangers. <laughs> um, so while she's stuck in her prism, Justin's like, I'll come back for you. We got to go move your house. And the rats have set up, I guess, a pulley system, I think, in order yeah, to move, move her house. So they lift up the cinder block and are like, pulling it around to the other side of the rock or something like that. And that was when... Apparently, I never caught the black rat's name. Jenner? Is it Jenner? Okay. I guess it is Jenner. Maybe that's why I didn't catch it, because it's so close to Jeremy, um, the oh. crow. <laughs> so, um, he decides that he's going to cut the pulley line so that it will smush Nicodemus, and that's how he will take over... The rat kingdom. Even it though his almost worked. Yeah, it did almost work. His friend that was kind of helping him and backing him kind of sort of backed out like at the very last minute, but he still managed to mush Nicodemus with the house that her children were in at the time. <laughs> 
oh, I guess because um, the younger kid couldn't be moved out of the house. But I was still like, why are all the other children in the house? Right. <laughs> like, solidarity, I'm sure. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I was like, I probably would stay with my little brother and <laughs> ensure that he survives the trip. But um, let me see. Brisby manages to find a way out of the birdcage by pushing the water dish and getting out. And she basically gets there. Then she get there like right in time to see that her house has now fallen and Nicodemus is dead. Yeah, she gets out there and sees that yeah, it's it's like kind of stuck in the mud. Nicodemus like you only see like part of his arm just kind of like sticking out of some rubble. Yeah. And it's like, "Oh." And, and then the the house, the, the cinder block starts sinking into the mud. Yep, it starts sinking down, so her parents are going to be drowned. Meanwhile, like be- right before it starts sinking down, though, Justin fights Jenner. Yeah, they have a big, like, big, swor- like sword swashling. Like. Yeah, sword fight kind of thing. Um, Jenner kills, like, slashes at his friend, because his friend is like, this is wrong. And he goes to kill his friend. And then he goes to fight Justin. Um, Justin does a great job. He does win the fight. But as Justin is sort of given this speech about how he's going to be the leader of the rats now or something. Um, Jenner recovers and is about to attack him from behind. When his friend Rat that he had tried to kill throws his dagger at Jenner. Throws it right into his back, and Jenner dies that way. And then that friend guy, I don't even know his name, <laughs> dies. A lot was happening in this movie, and I clearly yeah, do not write a good lot, notes. A, a, lot of, a lot of rat murder. Yeah, a lot of rat murder. Yeah, and this is where you get the blood, because he actually had blood on his stomach where Jenner had stabbed him, or slashed him. And I was just like, what is happening? I think I was saying that to you. I'm like, what is happening? Like, what <laughs> Why are we having this, like, King Arthur <laughs> kind of <laughs> fighting going on? It's very Shakespearean. Yes, it's very... Like, sh- fighting. <laughs> yeah. Um, the house starts to sink. Um, they try to get the ropes back, attached back to the pulley system, but it's just too... It's sinking too fast. The mud is too strong. So it sinks under... Um, Mrs. Brisby kind of sort of almost lose hope, but that's when she realizes, oh, I have the amulet. And the the magical terms for it was like through the courage of the heart or something like that. May you use it or whatever. So she uses the f- power to lift the cinder block up and out of the mud and put it where she needed the house in order to be safe. Um... She almost catches fire first, but she manages to control it to save her children and puts the house where it should be and then proceeds to faint because that was a lot of power. Yeah, Yeah, they make it seem like that thing was, like, burning her, but because she needed to be brave, she just, like, powered through it. Because I noticed, like, in a few scenes later, they're showing one of her kids bandaging her hands. Yeah. It really did hurt her. Yeah, it actually really did burn her, it seems like, burn her hands in order to use that power. Um, Which, yeah, when it comes to saving your children, um, parents have often proved that you can ignore your own pain in order to save your child. It's like this weird... What do they call it? I don't know if it's, like... It's like mom something or mother instinct or or something like that where like a woman who normally wouldn't be able to lift a car can lift a car if that car is squishing her child. Like it's it's that kind of thing like where you just ignore your pain. In fact, humans get this in general when it comes to saving other humans, children or not, where just the adrenaline cuts every all the pain out in order to do the task that needs to be done to save a life. Um, I can't remember what it's actually called, but. Adrenaline rush in general does come with pain relief, or yeah. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I guess it has been like a documented phenomena, like mm-hmm. hysterical strength or something like that, where yeah. uh, people 
just get that uh i think that was the basis of the 1970s incredible hulk uh, tv shows that like oh in an extreme emergency the body will tap into like that hidden energy to be able to do something like that yeah and uh it's not necessarily like tapping into i think what actually happens is your body shuts down the things that block you from doing that stuff because you will get hurt doing that stuff but oh, your brain yeah. just kind of shuts down so there's like this interesting like when you touch something hot and your first reflex is to drop the hot thing but there's a counter reflex that can also happen for if the hot thing is fragile or your food or something that you don't want to drop so the counter reflex enables you to hold that hot thing to place it down gently instead of just dropping it something it shuts off that initial first reflex of ow hot let go which is a very quick and rapid reflex that doesn't even usually get to your brain but there is also the counter reflex of no 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 i can't just drop this casual dish like i need to (laughs) set it down that's kind of sort of along the lines of that but even more extreme when it comes to those life and death situations of needing to save a life or get somebody out of a burning building or stuff like that um it's really quick and rapid time slows down all that stuff Adrenaline rushes are fun. <laughs> so, yeah. I've been in one, I've had an adrenaline rush once when I had a kid fall in front of me and hit <laughs> his temple. I swore he hit directly his temple on the corner of a shelf. And you just Eesh. knew through the hit that this is bad. And yeah, he started bleeding pretty much right away. But I managed to get to him, move him, get gauze on him tell the other person in the room to call for help to call 911 like i managed to do all that and then later on seeing it on camera on like our security feed and just seeing like everything i did was like oh my gosh like that seemed like to happen through a long amount of time but it was actually very short and like it was so central focused so oh yeah yeah that's why like (laughs) being in a car accident feels like it's Mm -hmm. going in slow motion when that kicks in it's pretty yeah pretty fun the body is fun and interesting but there we go so yep the um, her house was moved her arms her hands are getting bandaged and you find out that mrs brisby just gave the amulet to justin and justin is now the leader of the rats oh and her son is alive and well and he (laughs) wants to play outside Yes, the and <laughs> yeah. Jeremy, well, Jeremy finds oh. his soulmate. I forgot, Jeremy does run into a lady crow, and it's his soulmate, and it ends with them giggling and flying away with thread between them, and you're like, yeah. why did he even exist, other than he needed the flyer <laughs> to the great owl? <laughs> like, the end. The, se- yeah. the sequel you had mentioned before is actually about her youngest son, Timothy. Timothy was her son's name, right? Yeah, her youngest son, Timothy, is going to become the leader of the Rats of Nim. Oh. And that's his story of how he's going to become the leader of the Rats of Nim. And it takes place. The sequel came out in, like, the late 90s, if I remember. Yeah, was it? It's, um... Or maybe it was 2000-something, actually. It might have been even... Wow. I can't remember. I looked it up, and it was significantly later than I thought it was going to be. Uh, yeah, 1998. Take me to the rescue. Mm-hmm. That's, um... It looks bad. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it did good. It, it doesn't look like it's the same quality of animation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, speaking of which, th- so the studio that did this, which was the Don Bluth Studios, they're the ones that are famous for doing things like uh, Five Will Goes West, Five Will. Uh, An American Tale, land before time mm-hmm. like these were all and don bluth i believe one of his last movies that he did was i think he did the rescuers for disney <laughs> before he finally quit and was like yeah i, I need to go start my own studio because disney's like cutting too many corners i like the rescuers um and they're supposedly <laughs> in the trivia because i didn't catch this but mm-hmm. at the beginning of this movie there's a scene apparently where you see like a dragonfly flying around yeah. And that dragonfly is from the rescuers. Yes. What's his name? Oh, I can't remember his name. Somebody says it in the thick Cajun accent in the movie. But yeah, I didn't yeah. even recognize that was the same dragonfly, though. I used to love The Rescuers was one of my favorite movies as a kid. In fact, I might add that to our gem list. Um, 
because it is a very underrated Disney film, <laughs> too. So. Yeah. Also, the voice, I think it was the voice of the crow, Jeremy, was the voice of the tiger from Fifel. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, that American was uh, Dom DeLuise, mm-hmm. who did a lot of work with uh, Dom Bluth. Dom Bluth also did the animation for that weird laser disc game that came out in the early 80s, uh, Dragon Slayer. Oh, okay. Where you had um, the really dorky, like, knight character named Jerk the Daring. Right. Yeah, I don't think I played yeah. that video game, but I have heard of it. Yeah, it's it's a weird one. It was a laser disc. It it, it was essentially uh, kind of ahead of its time because um, before the days of DVD, you had laser discs, which mm-hmm. looked like giant record CDs. Um, mm-hmm. And so this type of video game, it wasn't programmed in such a way that it was um, like sprites, I guess you could say, or like bits. Yeah. It was actually like video. And the way you control it is at certain points on the screen, there would be prompts and you're supposed to either press an action button or move the, the directional pad in a certain like direction, like up, down, left, right, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And if you press it at the right time, then that would tell the video, okay, play the next scene. Or if you do it wrong, then it'll play like a failure animation and it'll show your character dying. So it was kind of interesting because it, it's a game that doesn't really require skill, just memorization. Hmm. And if you figure it out or could remember all of the moves, then you could play the whole game with one quarter and you're essentially just watching uh, like a, I want to say it was like a 15 or 20 minute cartoon. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I highly recommend it. The, the animation style for the princess was interesting to say the least um she was like a pre jessica rabbit let's put it that way okay dragon slayer princess 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 daphne i believe is her name let me see oh shoes i have to write the video game (laughs) i forgot there was that also the movie called dragon slayer so which is a great movie it is actually i the really good movie yep. see, I'm looking. oh inspirations from game of thrones oh i have okay yes now that i look at it i have heard about this and i have been <laughs> curious about it for because wow she is yep very jessica rabbity and yeah the night all these images look really yep that's in your search history now <laughs> yeah oh it's dragon slayer not slayer <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah, that's the other thing. It was like a pun. Yeah. So. I was like, oh, clever. Yeah. Slayer, layer, sounds the same through headphones. Sorry. <laughs> there was a there was a sequel that was set in outer space, but I don't remember off the top of my head what that one was called. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, Will Wheaton was a voice of this. Yes, of one of the little boy yeah. characters, and so it was um. Uh. Dorothy? No, what was her name? She was in Charmed and in... Oh, Shannon Doherty. That was her name. Oh, yeah. yeah. Shannon Doherty from Beverly Hills 90210 Ah. and Charmed and from some other things I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, Yeah, she played the character Teresa, which was, I think, the oldest oldest daughter. Yeah, yeah. And Will Wheaton played Martin, which was the the older son Jody Hicks who I'm not familiar with played Cynthia the younger daughter mm-hmm. and Ian Fried was Timothy the pneumonia suffering pneumonia. child yeah um let me see see Disney rejected it so like the first trivia thing is that Disney rejected this film for being too dark and I'm trying to think of when they did Black Cauldron. <laughs> Although, I will say, 
that as we were watching it, because I watched it with my mom, like I usually do, make her watch these movies with me. She was like, this is really dark for an animated series. She's like, it's got a lot of death in it. And I was like, Disney has a lot of death in it. And the death is fairly realistic. And I end up crying every single movie that they've been bringing out lately. So really, (laughs) what's so dark about it other than the coloring of it is significantly darker than other Disney animation? Other than the Black Cauldron, like... I I would say the actual darkness... um, Yeah, it does have, like, a really dark palette for some sequences, but I think that was necessary to show you, like I said, the the bright parts. Yeah. When they do, like, the glowing effects. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to have that to kind of balance it out. Um, If anything, I would say that the real darkness comes from, like, the character Jenner, who's, like, conspiring against his own people. Yeah. And willing to do murder in order to take take power. Yeah, which, I mean, is that any different from Scar, who killed his own brother? in order to take power like it's just that's that's just life in general there's always somebody that think they should be on top and will do anything to get there any immoral thing to get there um but i don't know it's just it does like all the dark parts are pretty dark but then the farm is also very bright but and I also yeah, feel like a lot of the 80s animation, though, like even the rescuers is darker in coloring as opposed to the brightness that you see nowadays in animation. Yeah. And I think overall, though, it definitely um, we we went too far away from that. And it, then a lot of our animation became a little too saccharine mm-hmm. and too like cleaned up. Yeah. Um, where, like, I want to definitely say, like, starting with, like, Beauty and the Beast, they started to shy away from really showing any kind of, like, truly dark things. Yeah. Because uh, I would say... Um, the Little Mermaid, Little Mermaid had darkness in it. Like, Ursula's lair was fairly dark. Yeah, like, that, that had some darkness to it. The evil eels, and um, especially, like, the fact that they kill Ursula by, like, impaling her through the gut with the boat. <laughs> I was like, wow, like, this one's pretty violent. But then it just kind of, like, cleaned it up afterwards, and you haven't really gotten anything like that since. Like, the, the Mufasa thing, it happens mostly off-camera. Um, although I did see a, a fan theory video on YouTube recently that says that um, that Scar had to have eaten Mufasa afterwards. That that one scene that you see afterwards where Scar's talking to a skull on his paw, that that's Mufasa's skull. And they even compare it to what real lion skulls look like. And I was like, well, you know what? That's true. Like, what would have happened to Mufasa's body? Well, I assume he let the hyenas so, eat it. So Supposedly, hyenas don't eat lion. Because they actually look at, like, the science behind, like, the animals. Oh. And it's like, well, hyenas aren't known for eating lion, but other lions do eat lions. Yeah, that's true. They can be cannibalistic. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting one if you want to look into that and see if the theory holds true that he... Because they, they also have... It's in that same scene where Scar is telling Zazu to sing him a song, and he sings It's a Small World. <laughs> Yeah, no, I remember the skull scene. I just never noticed that it looked like a lion skull. Um, Apparently it does. uh, Yeah, I'd... It makes it creepier. I'd believe it. Um, Well, the other thing they don't talk about is that he would also have to... Well, Scar would also have to kill all the cubs, because that's what lions would do, is they would kill all the cubs so that they can put the lionesses back in heat so that he can make babies with all the lionesses. Um which I think is kind of sort of where you get Lion King 2, where Kovu and whatever exists, but they're not considered Scar's kids. I, I don't know. Anyway, um, but yeah, lions are interesting. They're very interesting creatures. I did not know hyenas wouldn't eat lion. Like, I know hyenas wouldn't necessarily attack a lion unless they were defending the carcass, because hyenas are scavengers, usually. Mm-hmm. Um but I didn't know if, if like if they came across a dead lion, if they would eat one or not. I don't know. I don't know that one. I couldn't tell you that. 
have not looked up hyenas in quite a while. <laughs> um, I tend to like African painted dogs a lot more than hyenas, but <laughs> although hyenas are also yeah. very cool. Evan Rude, Evan Rude. That was the name of the dragonfly and the rescuer is Evan Rude. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of it. Go, Evan Rude. It came back go. around. Yes. Um, of course that would. Because um, I'm just looking at the trivia because we're oh. not even, are we at an hour now? Oh yeah, we're, we're almost to an hour. But I don't know. I just, This was <laughs> a very good at the release. It was the largest non-Disney animated movie, apparently, which actually doesn't surprise me because although it was wild and crazy, like I definitely feel like it would have done good for the time. Apparently it did. And some of the trivia I was reading about the movie was talking about how in order to make sure they could complete the movie under budget, some of the animators even put some of their own money into mm. it and got like mortgages on their houses and stuff. And I was like, wow. But they really believed in it that much that they were willing to do that. Yeah. So I was like, well, I'm glad that worked mm-hmm. out. I guess it was mildly successful, even though it had a lot of competition at the time that it came out. I think it came out the same summer as E.T., which got a lot more oh, well, yeah. of the of the, of the ticket sales. Yeah. But it still did relatively well, well especially for, for not being Disney. Yeah, it did specify animated feature, not feature in general. Because, um, yeah, well, I forgot E.T. came out in 82. I don't know why it was always a little later, but yeah, it was it was interesting do you think it should be brought back or redone is it good as it is would you change anything Uh, i don't think you can remake it the same way Mm -hmm. but it does stand for a remake um if you're more truthful if you're more this would make a good mini series on netflix yeah Um, where you could actually like dwell into it a little bit more and maybe give mrs brisby because there's a lot there, there's a lot that happens like this uh, it, <laughs> this whole movie like condenses a lot of story and it feels like it it feels like it's heavily edited down like I feel like we needed to have one final scene with Justin and Mrs. Brisby where they even like you know where they discuss Jonathan where she finds out more stories about him firsthand mm-hmm. where she says why she wants to give him the amulet even though she told Nicodemus that she was going to treasure it forever yeah I was like, I, I was like, she just said she was gonna always treasure it, and yet, there obviously there was a scene that happened off camera where she just gave it away. What was the logic for that? You know, it must have meant something for her to want to give it away, but we don't get that. It, we're just left kind of unresolved. Yeah. And I feel like it's definitely one that, with modern storytelling, in a setting like, um, where you can actually develop the story a little bit better, mm-hmm. that yes, this would be um, something to dive into again. Did they ever actually confirm whether or not she killed Dragon the Cat? Um, okay. I don't... Well, because well, they kept saying that she was going to poison Dragon, but what I always assumed they meant was that it was just going to like knock him out. I don't think it was like... Oh. I assumed poison, it was going to kill the cat. Cause <laughs> but yeah, like I don't think they ever show the cat being dead. So I'm going to assume that yeah. it was more like just to knock him out. Okay. I guess that makes sense. Um, I guess apparently this used a lot of new features and stuff, and I didn't realize it. So they were doing a lot of different techniques with lighting and stuff like that in order to make this, which actually comes across really well, I think. Oh, yeah. Like. I guess it was kind of new at the time. They were doing rear, uh, was it rear lighting for some of the scenes? Yeah. Which is what gave them that really awesome, crazy, glowy look. Yeah. Because, like, I thought about it afterwards. And I was like, oh, yeah, how would you make something glow in animation? You know, would you just draw it like it's glowing? That seems like it would be impractical. I was like, no, you actually, yeah, actually. make the, the animation cell glow from the rear and shoot that. And that gives you that effect. Yeah. Which is like. That's brilliant. Yeah, it was really... Why don't they do that This movie looks really good, and it looks... Like, to me, it's it's definitely done by Disney animators. Like, there's no doubt. And it's definitely... They were... I 
kind of serve him like, yeah, in the 80s, you should have left the Disney company because they were not letting people be creative at all. Like, they were all about trying to save money and they were cutting a lot of creativity and they were even cutting the Imagineering department and it was just people were making really bad decisions at that time. Um, yeah. But eventually they figured it out. But but yeah, this, this was a great, really well movie. I think it's great how it is. I do agree with you that there should be a few things. I do think it would make an excellent show to get more character development more than anything. Um, because I feel like they don't solidify that Brisby is a coward. Like, they're trying to hint that she is when she's still willing to do all these things. Like, to me, she doesn't change too much. She's clearly always willing to do anything for her children. I don't know why they pretend to say that she is a coward in the beginning when she went to go see Mr. Ages, which was clearly hard to get to in the beginning. So, I would... Yeah, no, she's she's constantly putting herself in harm's way for the greater good and Mm self-sacrificing and um yeah yeah they but and yet they never give her her own name yeah never give her her own name nope not once i think i called her shannon i don't know why i called her shannon but (laughs) um (laughs) yeah it's just i like the i I like what i read in the trivia that they uh retroactively named her elizabeth Mm -hmm. brisby after the actress that voiced her yeah um, sadly, this was the voice actress's last animation role or last major role mm-hmm. um, before she eventually ended up taking her own life. Mm. And I was like, oh, well, then she will be Elizabeth Brisby. That is kind of sort of nice that they honored the actress that way. Um, sad that she took her life. I'm sad that she didn't get help that she needed and that people didn't see she needed to get help. So, yeah. If, yeah. yeah. No, it, I mean, mental health, it's an issue. Yes, mental health is an issue, especially in the 80s. We were not handling mental health very well at all. It is thankfully oh, getting no. better nowadays, and there is a lot of resources. So if you're ever... I feel like I have to say, like, if, if you ever feel you need help, please go and get it. Um call the suicide hotline yes call the suicide hotline talk to somebody you are needed and you are wanted in this world um so yeah anything else to add about the secret of nim are you gonna watch the sequel (laughs) you know i might I might end up making that one of my week's watches somewhere later yeah. on, but I I have a really bad feeling that I'm not going to enjoy it, <laughs> um, that I'm just going to yeah. be like crapping on it for not having the same quality of animation. Because Don Bluth Studios, mm-hmm. they they also kind of crapped the bed at one point. So well, I think it happens. There was like just such a downturn in animation for a while. Like people just don't take it seriously. In fact, I really, really, really want Disney to bring back hand-drawn animation again so bad the last one they did was um the princess and the frog which is one of my favorite princess movies um in general i just i want that come on just keep like once every 10 years can you please bring back back hand-drawn animation and i'm saying this to like all animated studios not just disney i love hand-drawn animation it takes not that computer doesn't take skill and artistry but there's just something so powerful about knowing that every single cell has been drawn by an artist to move the way it moves and having the layering and all the awesome animated techniques that um Walt Disney created and other animated companies created like um like Don Bluth and his lighting technique like how they think of doing that things I just I want to bring back the art of hand-drawn animation (laughs) in some way Please. Shit. There's some. There's still a lot that can be done in the old methods, and you can't replicate that. That just takes skill and time, and uh, you know that's the only downside I can really see, though, is that it's it's such a time-consuming mm-hmm. endeavor yeah. to pursue. Um, that that's I don't know. Like sometimes 
doing even menial things if I know it's just going to take a while <laughs> it, I just end up having to procrastinate it even though I could be done in like 15 minutes yeah I just rather put it off because I just don't want to do it because it's like uh yeah that I guess that kind of makes sense but still I I will wait years for y'all to make it please do a hand drawn <laughs> animated I don't need the awesome computer generated animation to see like fuzzy things on Mr. Incredible's sweater when he wears it like I just I just think you just you know, need that a being story, said yeah. I love the texture that you see on the emotions on uh, Inside Out oh yeah the way they all look like they're like staticky kind of or fuzzy looking yeah the texture of Inside that's Out that's pretty cool really cool I like the glow of the soul people and soul too um, just how oh, they, I like, watch that. You should watch Soul. Soul is, I really liked it. You either like it or you hate it, though. That is, that is what I have noticed from people. I mean, I guess it depends on how they treat the afterlife. I guess because there's some that really are like annoying. There's one movie I really like called Defending Your Life. It's kind of a comedy. I love that movie so much, too. Oh, yeah. oh I love that movie. I, I love how they show you the afterlife in that one, where it's kind of, like, very bureaucratic and, like, clinical yeah. in a way. Well, it kind of um, doesn't, though, because that's, like, whether or not you need to relive your life or whether or not you can go on to the afterlife. So... You still don't yeah. technically see what the afterlife is like because he's was, technically in was purgatory. Was that Meryl Streep? No, it was not Meryl Streep. Uh, I do not. It is a. Who oh, was that? who was that? That was um, Albert Brooks and someone else. Who was that? I don't know. Ah, Defending Your Life is such a good movie. That even definitely is a gem. We don't need to watch it to know that it's a gem. Yeah. <laughs> we know. It's oh, it a is gem, Meryl yes. Streep. You're oh, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was. Um, so yeah, like <laughs> I love how like they're they're because I I assume that if there is an afterlife, there's going to be something like that where you can replay or rewatch your past lives as well. Mm -hmm. And I love how she was like some kind of dashing like knight or warrior in some like one of her past yeah. lives, and he was like being eaten by lions in like the African bush or something yeah that and I think that was also like kind of a good message that we're all kind of connected because they were clearly people that they weren't currently like they were clearly different people like he was an African at one time she was a yeah. male knight at one time but she's still the same soul which I really liked yeah. that um yeah but soul is actually not quite like about the afterlife soul is actually about before life pre life oh is actually the what soul is about wait there's another one that deals with that where it's like more like being recycled what was that one that was where i think robert downey jr was in that one oh where he he dies and then like he is bewildered because he's in like the afterlife technically mm. and they're like oh you need to go you need to go because like he needs to be reincarnated yeah. and they're supposed to give him some kind of injection to forget his past life and they forget to give it to him because it was like too much in a rush so when he's reborn he still subconsciously has some of his memories from his past life because they didn't give him like the amnesia shot mm. i think that was robert downey jr I feel like I remember the plot. We are getting very off topic, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we are near the end. So I think we both agree that it would be great as an animated show. It should definitely be hand-drawn, but although that would be really hard to do. Maybe just make it computer-drawn, but like look like hand-drawn. Um, but um, but yeah, it was good. It was fun to watch The Secret of Nim, 1982. Please give Mrs. Brisby a name. <laughs> Do not just refer to It'll her. be Elizabeth. Yeah, it'll be Elizabeth. So, Elizabeth Brisby. Refer to her as that in the next version of this film. All right. So, where can people tweet at you to tell you what that possibly Robert Downey Jr. pre life movie is? Oh, I found it. It's called Chances Are. Oh, okay. All right. 
It says, a reincarnated man unknowingly falls in love with his own daughter from his previous life. Yikes. Oof. And then tries to uh, end their relationship before angels erase his memory. All right. Well, that uh, took a weird turn. That was really weird. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can <laughs> at me uh, on Twitter. I am at Magic Bollocks. You can at me on Twitter as well as J.M. Bailey writes. You can find archives of this podcast and other podcasts that we are on, um, especially check us out on Geeks Watch. We are currently watching Shadow and Bone on Netflix um, for the Geeks Watch. Um, you can find those on geekalitemedia.com. You can also find us as at Geekalate Media on Twitter and Instagram and facebook.com forward slash Media. We do also, if you have some extra money for the month, uh, you can also join our Patreon page where you will find exclusive content and be able to fill out questionnaires over what you would like us to talk about on a podcast, stuff like that, um, and as well as bonus content and some surprise funny bloopers sometimes I think are posted on there as well. Um, Please, wherever, whatever podcatcher you're listening at, to this on, please rate, review, and subscribe. That is also a huge help to us. Uh, until then, always remember to geek out. geek out. This concludes our broadcast. Peace.